Good. I just got off the stage, tired, beat up a little bit. I rocked the crowd hard today. My voice a little hoarse. Got uh, I think eight more shows. I got a couple days off. Then I head uh, I think overseas and uh, just working hard. You know? You're doing your own Canada tour right now. We're doing a Canada run right now. So far we did Toronto tonight. We did Montreal. We did Ottawa and a couple of small towns like K Kitchener. And uh, there's another small town we did. Shit, 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 shit. I don't know. Another small town so far. But we got a whole ton. We got a lot of other ones coming up too. You know, the Van City, obviously, and, and uh, you know, a couple of other people. Yeah, I am rap, big swing, and dang, I'm Yeah, well, I had Night of Bloody a Apes, American Low Life, Die Rugged Man Die. I had Legendary Classics, which had 10 brand new songs on it that were never released, that were missing forever, but it had old songs on it too. You know, because I made it 20 songs or 18 songs. And then I got this Legends Never Die. And I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs in my catalog. So, you know, it is what it is. But people always want to try to, you know, second. Nah, fuck, you don't know what you're no, no, about. I don't know. I, I Not don't. you, but that's what the internet says. So all you can do is look on the internet and what the internet tells yeah, you. Sure. you know, like if I read. Uh, you know, Margaret Thatcher used to have a cock on the internet. I'm like, oh, Marjorie, Margaret you know, she had a cock. You know, you, you know, people believe what they read on the internet, you know? Yeah, or maybe, even, maybe even 11. You know? what, what was your lyrics about problem about candies? About no, professors? No. I don't One know. One of the best rappers, hey, Roxanne Chante was 13 when she was destroying men. In, in the 80s, When I was on the come up, all the best rappers were teenagers. LL Cool J was 16 years old. It wasn't like today if you're 15 or 16, it's like, oh, he's a kid, so he's allowed to be whack. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, uh, the, the Bow Wows or whatever. I don't know, I don't even say that, he's not whack. But I'm just saying, like, back then, the best rappers on the earth were teenagers. It wasn't like today where, like, cats like myself could do the shit, or cats way older than me, like Jay-Z, or, you know, them dudes who still making records. And, and, because what happened is when rap turned into a business and rappers turned into businessmen, the teenagers ain't businessmen, they're kids. So them dudes ain't the ones able to make the proper moves. The young kids today are still can, in their 20s, most of them. They go, oh, that guy's young and he's like 25, yeah. 27, 24. True, true. You can't name true. 20 respected artists that are not in their, that, that are in their teenage years. You can't name five, you know? Sweet. Or maybe you can name five, maybe. But most of them is, is 20, 30, and 40, and 50. True. But uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I think, you know, the, the youth should be heard. And, and the youth, hip hop started as a youthful art form for the kids to come and, and speak their mind. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with all ages doing it. Like, I think rap should be like, like, like when the Rolling Stones, like how they're 70 years old, still rocking. I think Chuck D and them, they're 50 right now, still rocking. So they, you know, they, they're all, they're gonna be up there with the Stones soon, you know. <laughs> they're up there, they're up there. They're they're all of famous. I'm talking about old old age. I'm saying like Chuck, like like Rolling Stone age. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. So they're not up there with the Rolling Stones. Chuck, nah, Chuck know, D's not Mick Jagger's know, fucking age. No, you choose. Yeah, I'm just saying But, like 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 you know. I think that rappers will still be able to tour and make money and do good shows when it when it when it in their 60s and 70s like these fucking rock stars like the Bob Dylans and all these guys you know I think De La Soul could you know rock into their 60s if they want to do it you know so how do you rate give a, a little bit of history about the kid that was on stage with you how do you rate him like as skills like in 2013 like that's several times like you bring a kid. 11 years old, 12 years old, 13, I don't know how old he's. I found him when he was 10. And uh, he's, a, uh, he's a good MC. You know, MC's uh, is about moving the crowd, like Rakim said. It's about getting the crowd hype and entertaining the crowd. And the boy could do it. He could do all those intricate flows and he could do all of that stuff. And the crowd loves him. So, um, you know, if he, if he works hard and stays committed, 
you know, he could be the future. He could, he could What's be his one name? Of the... Steve, you Stevie. Steve. Stevie the rugged kid. But he's looking for another name right now, you know. It was the album I was able to take the most time on and, and had the most freedom on and could do everything I wanted to exactly the way I wanted to. But uh, every year your work is supposed to get better. So if I put out another album in the future, that one is going to be better than this one. You know, that's my job, or I should retire. <laughs> my next album will be better, and the next album after that will be better, and my next album after that will be better. My job in life as an artist is to get better every year. Yeah. So every every album I put out will always be better than the next, you know, unless, unless my engineer dies and I can't get a guy to mix it as good and then the beat makers start turning whack and like in 20 years or something, you know. How like long some, have you been working with that engineer? We've been working together for 10 years. What's his name? Chris Conway. He's one of 10 best. years. So without him, that shit won't sound crisp. Well, what happened, you know what's happened is he, he moved out of Chung King studio and he got his own little studio in Brooklyn and I didn't like his room. And all of a sudden, like for two, three years, I didn't have him. I didn't have him, my shit didn't sound the way it did with him and I lost him. So I went to other engineers and tried to find the right engineer to make my shit sound right and nobody could do it as good as him. And then uh, he ended up getting a, a, a spot in a mystery studio, dope room, dope sound. And he got his, uh, Chris got his groove back and the mixes sound better than they did or just as good as they ever did in his career. And Chris is one of the best engineers to me, man. He, he started off with Diamond D and Showbiz and all that in the DITCs. He was working with, uh, you know, Fat Joe and Pun and Kane and Mary J. Blige and then, and then the Eminem stuff. And then, and then you know, he just kept building up the, um, Resume, Big E work, you know, he worked with everybody. And then, you know, uh, all the Wu-Tang, you know, he's been around for a lot of years. So, And he's one of the very few that stayed in business from that era because what happened when everybody got their own home studios, a lot of the great engineers from the 90s kind of stopped getting work because everyone, oh, I can mix it myself, I can mix it myself. And all the studios went under and, and so he survived the storm. So I got a classic, uh, you know, knowledgeable guy that was from the 90s who knows how to mix like 2013 and knows how to mix from the 90s and the 80s. So uh, that's the only kind of engineer I, I, I need to work with or, or I, I don't know if I could even make music anymore because I want it to sound like that. I want it to sound authentic. These new school mixes where people put all the highs in it, I never want my stuff to sound like that. Where it's all reverbed out and, and, and thin and tingle. Like, I want my shit to sound big, thick, bassy and hard. And uh, not even dirty, clean, hard, bassy, thick, you know. Uh, but if the sample's supposed to be dirty, it needs to be dirty, but, you know, audible dirty, you know what I mean? So, so you know, Chris is one of the best, and I'm, I'm blessed to have him. So. Did you plan to work with Alchemist? I worked with Alchemist before on a D&D &D project it was, uh, called Kill It. It was a song with Channel Live and Craig G. Oh my God, somebody else famous. Oh, my boy Adolf. Yeah, Agala. Agala. Yeah, so, uh, that would have sucked. Got my man. But, uh, worked with Alchemist before. Worked with a lot of the guys. A lot of the classic. Buck Wild came back on my new album. Buck Wild's one of the, one of the, one of the greats. I mean, I, 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 I knew Buck before he ever made a beat. Or, no, 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 I met Buck when he was making, like, his first beat. So I met Buck. No, but I'm cool with working with, see here's the thing is man, producers don't have to be big names or little names or anything, producers just gotta be dope, I'm never one of them dudes that like, you know, uh, oh, who's the most famous, you know, like you can get a beat from the most famous cat out there, and they might not have a beat better than the cat that ain't as known, like I think Mr. Green, who's known to a degree, but, from London? No, nah, Mr. Green is from, from New Jersey. But uh, no, that's Professor Green. Professor Green. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think Green is, is is my favorite producer, one of the favorite producers I ever worked with, and uh, I love working with the kid. He's just everything he does bangs. I mean, you know, I worked with everybody from fucking 
Alchemist, I told the track masters, the Eric Sermons, to the, the, the Havocs, to the, you know, I worked with everybody, man. So, beat makers, and this boy, Mr. Green, could give any producer out there a run for his money, man. I'm calm, I'm a grown man, and I'm trying to keep everything cool. So that's not never playing a role, ever. I'm always like, whatever the fuck is really in my head is what comes out of me, you know? And however my mind tells me to react, that's really how I react. I never put on no circus act where like, let me say the right thing for the camera and act this way, or let me act that way for the camera. I just, I'm always just me, man, you know? So. <laughs> my father. <laughs> well, I think all governments are corrupt, and I think all governments corrupt too, and I think that uh, all governments take the lives of innocent people, and it's terrible, you know, but that's part of the world. But uh, uh, they're more powerful than us, they're more rich than us, and... You know, you try to, all you can do is speak your mind about it, say, oh, I don't like it, and you can try, but like, they, they got a lot of force, and I guess maybe if the pe people come together to fight the powers and all of that stuff, but I don't really know, I'm not a genius, I don't know how to overcome that stuff, but the, you know, there's a lot of, uh, these drone strikes, there's ch little innocent babies being murdered, uh, you know, they just boom, innocent, innocent uh, uh, civilians is getting murdered, and, uh, you know, it's not really a, a war's an ugly thing, you know, and uh, there's so, um, the media kind of just doesn't show you what's really going on. They don't want you to know. They want to do uh, Paula, Paula Dean said the N-word or, or Kim Kardashian's having a baby what's with Kanye on the, West. Trayvon or, Martin? Well, <clears throat> Trayvon Martin's a terrible incident, but it's, um, the media is blowing it up and the, the public, see, here's what I think about it. July, 4th, the weekend of the 4th of July, there were seven people, seven black people murdered from gunfire in Chicago alone. And we don't know any of their names and nobody gives a fuck because the media is not saying their names. These people in society, if you tell them, this is important, this is the dead person you should care about, this is what you need to care about. Of course you can care for Trayvon Martin, but why don't you care about the kid that died two blocks away from your house that got shot and killed? And, and, and the murder was never captured. <laughs> or, or the guy, you know, a borough away from you that got shot to death or stabbed to death or, or the kid or, or the hundred people in uh, the, the, another country that just died, you know, you know. They don't care about nothing except what they're told to care about. So Trayvon Martin is a tra tragedy, man. But there's, why is it the only tragedy that anyone cares about when there's horrible things happening every minute and they don't, they don't give a shit unless the media tells them this is the one you should care about. And they try to say, okay, and they made a race, racial conflict. They turned a Hispanic man into a white guy to, yeah. to, to divide the country. Like, oh, this, this white man killed this black kid. It's not what happened, it was a Hispanic. And then all of a sudden they made a fake term, this white Hispanic. The fuck you mean white is he's a Hispanic man? You know, and, and but that is the goal of the, yeah, of the yeah. media. And, and, and then it's like first black president. You're not saying first white black president, you're saying first black president. You, then all of a sudden this guy's in men is the white Hispanic because they want to make it a racial thing where the white man killed the black guy. And you know, you know what's kind of crazy is that black on black crime, um, how come it's okay to people? It's not okay, obviously, but how come people don't make a fuss when a black man murders a black man? And it happens all the time. And Perfect. they don't try to fix nothing. They don't complain about it. They don't cry, cry about it. They're crying for Trayvon. Like, oh, you know, tears for Trayvon, Tr Trayvon and Kim Kardashian talking about, oh, oh, uh, you know, Trayvon, we hope there's justice for, for you. And meanwhile, yo, your father's Kardashian who got OJ off. What do you mean justice? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. Kardashian, who's your father? I saw, I saw somebody say that. I was like, wow. You know, that was like... So that, that was just somebody posted that on my face, like, yo, Kardashian must have forgot who her father is. Yeah, but, but, but the thing is, everybody wants justice. And, and the fact that people are angry that, that, that Trayvon didn't get his justice is understandable. 
But how come you're not angry about any other misjustice? Because you're not programmed to be angry about it. You weren't told to be angry about it. You, 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 you know, so, so that's how society is. You tell somebody, hey, look, this is the important case. And now he's a celebrity. And now this is bad that he died more than any other dead child. So, so the kid who you grew up in your neighborhood with, who got murdered three months ago, you don't even talk about him. But you talk about this complete stranger like he's your family. And you're, oh, his family, his family. But you didn't even go to the kid who got murdered on your block. You didn't go see his family and even go to the, the, the wake or nothing and didn't even say, oh, shit, he got killed. That's crazy. Boom, move on. That's all you said about a kid you grew up with. You know, that's how society is. But since somebody's on TV, oh, you know, that's, that's the one. You know, so it is what it is. You know, uh, rest in peace, Trayvon. But rest in peace to the, to the, to the um, nameless people who are being brutally murdered in the streets every day, too, which we don't know their names. Because the media ain't telling it to us. Because there's there's no um, uh, narrative that they like for that particular story, so they won't tell you about that death. Because the narrative doesn't fit the media. They'll only tell you about the death if the narrative fits the media. You know.